So you'll remember in his address to the nation last month, President Tsil Ramaphosa said the stark reality is that every single district in South Africa has the potential to become a hotspot, coronavirus hotspot, unless we observe the current preventative measures. He also said that the new variant of COVID-19 is now well established in our country. So where does this leave our children who will be going to school very soon? What about vaccines? There's good news on that front. South Africa will be receiving this 1 million doses this month and 500,000 doses in February from the Serum Institute of India. But what about children? Have clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines been expanded to include them? Let's get some answers now from a better mind. Professor Rafilwe Masakela is the head of Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She joins us now via Zoom. Professor, always a pleasure having you on the program. Welcome. Good morning, Blaine. Thank you very much for having me. Look, we know that the clinical trials conducted tests, uh, the, you know, with regards to the vaccine, the safety and efficacy in adults. But what are we learning about how the vaccine affects younger children? Has uh, clinical trials been expanded to include them? Okay, so I think you, uh, you've just caught us just um, as the expansion uh, period for the trials has started in the younger age groups. So um, the AstraZeneca product, um, they have actually, uh, the, it's registered for people over the age of 50, of 16. So for uh, at the adolescent age group, the 16 to 18 year old age group would be covered by that. There's also other vaccines that there is now in the last week, they've started trialing it in younger children in the US yeah. uh, between the age of five and 12. So the, the news is there hasn't been um, data out yet to show us the efficacy uh, in younger children. But um, the good news is the trials are ongoing. They've already started enrolling in the US, for example, where we, they've now gone down to the younger age group so we can see about the efficacy of these vaccines in children. Right. So are vaccines typically first tested in adults before they're evaluated in children? Or does the process vary depending on the disease? Well, I think number one is it's... Uh, Remember, when we look at uh, trialing medications, vaccines, for example, we usually do it in different phases. Mm. Okay, so phase one usually is done, um, you know, once the drug has been tested in animals in the laboratory, then they would start testing it in healthy males. Uh, and then it would go on to either the target age group or, or the target um, group that's usually um, the vaccine is aimed at. But normally children would be last to be tested on any uh, drug drug which has unknown efficacy or safety because of course children are more vulnerable so, these, so this yes. is not an unusual situation children would normally be last to be tested for many drugs right. because um, of concerns about they the, they say the safety in younger children so these tests these clinical trials uh, what will these studies likely need to look at uh, the number of, of doses and the interval between the doses whether these elements needs to be adjusted for children perhaps are those the areas you will look at? Well, normally, if you look at drug and drug development, normally because children are growing and they have very different physiological dynamics when you compare them to adults. Normally in adults, you can usually give a, a standard dose uh, that's independent of individuals. But in children, because they're growing and you get different weights and you get different age categories, usually drugs would then be tailored for different age groups looking at specific dosing strategies. Of course, when the drug is normally first developed, they would do toxicity studies where they would give us increasingly high doses to see which doses are toxic and that would be worked out in milligrams per kilogram mm -hmm. so it's it's a very complex but fairly simple procedure of working out what kind of dose then you would then try in, in the younger age group uh, because with with younger children you'd have to work to work on different dose strategies because it would probably mo be more related to the child's weight uh, unlike yeah. in adults where you could just use a single dose Prof, it's one thing to have a vaccine. It's another to convince parents to actually take their children to get it. Uh, with regards to this COVID-19 vaccine, are you getting a sense that people are now feeling more comfortable than they were, say, last year on vaccinating children? Well, I think one of the... Uh 
key things in South Africa is, I think, in terms of vaccine hesitancy, those levels haven't been very high. Mm. But of course, there's a subgroup of parents and people who have this vaccine hesitancy. Uh, for whatever reason. Now we've, uh, for example, the immunizations that we have in our schedules currently have been around for many years and many parents are quite willing to use these vaccines. And um, for the COVID-19 vaccine, I think the message is um, these drugs have been tested in the laboratory on animals to see if they're toxic. They've been tested in, in, in humans to see if they have efficacy. And by efficacy, is we want to see whether the, the vaccine is robust enough to uh, stimulate an, your, an immune response in the individual so that when they're exposed to the, to the virus, then they, the body can respond to it. Right. So from looking at the data in the adults and um, the, now there have been a large number of individuals that have been vaccinated globally, there have been very, very minimal side effects. And the side effects that have been found in these vaccine, uh, in, in the COVID-19 vaccines that have been given to individuals in the US, for example, in Europe, are the normal ones that you'd expect with any vaccine that we give. You may have a, have a little bit of redness at the site of the injection. You may have a little bit of tenderness. There may be a little bit of fever. But these are sorts of the side effects that we see with all the variety of vaccines that we have available that we give to children millions of doses every year. Right. So I think people should be comforted to realize that there's no undue or unusual uh, uh, reactions that have been found, except for a few reports where people have had uh, anaphylactic reactions. I yeah. think really it looks like from the number of doses that have been given globally, there have been very few unusual side effects. Right. So I would say to a parent that's concerned that from looking at what has already been given around the world, this vaccine does not seem to have any unusual side effects of, that we know of and that it, it seems to be relatively safe to give in individuals, except for those people who have significant allergic reactions with other vaccines. Yeah. That's really the only concern that's been uh, cited in most of the guidelines around the world. So if you, if you had to follow the same model when you're doing uh, trials for, for children with regards to this vaccine, I mean, for the adults, the 16 and up, uh, this vaccine... It's, it's taking place. We've got this in, in record time. Uh, the Operation Warp Speed in America, for instance. Uh, some have questioned. I mean, because normally vaccine development takes about a decade, isn't it? So this is pretty very, very fast. Uh, you comfortable with regards to the model or, or the process that was uh, undertaken with regards to the development of these vaccines? And if that process uh, relates to children, I mean, if that same process, if you planted with regards to the vaccine for children, you comfortable with that? Well, remember um, that unlike a number of years ago, the technology that's available for us to develop these vaccines is, is novel. Yeah. Uh, there's been novel ways of, doing, uh, of, of developing these vaccines because of the uh, advances in technology. There, there's been ability for people to develop these vaccines much quicker than we would have done in the past. So I think from that perspective, we must just realize that unlike the other vaccines that we have available that took years to develop because of the technology that's available, that's one of the key factors that's already assisted us to be able to get such a fast tracked process to get the, the vaccine um, available. Right. Secondly, um, I think for people who are concerned about the speed that it's, it's happened, it's because we have all, it, there's been all this data available, there's genetics, there's use of nanotechnology. These technologies haven't used pre been used previously in other uh, vaccine development strategies. So I think technology in, at, this, uh, uh, at this stage uh, in 2020 uh, actually helped. Uh, for us to be able to fast track the process. So, of course, we do not have long term safety data of two to three years, which we would have with other vaccines. But from what we've seen so far, there have not been any significant worrisome signals from the vaccines. Right. So scientists are now studying this variant called 501v2 and its spread. Uh, what are we learning about this new variant and its effect on children? Well, I, I, uh, firstly, the, the variants um, that are being studied uh, here in, in South Africa, the U.S., Brazil, uh, where uh, they've been found, uh, remembering that in South Africa we have the specific mutation in the spike protein, uh, the uh, 485, uh, 484K, the, that vari variant, 
we we have seen there has there's been preliminary data that has been uh, not really peer peer reviewed showing that even in with people in this specific mutation which we have locally there there's still a robust immune response to the vaccine it may not be as well as if you didn't have this mutation but that's encouraging showing that even if you do get the vaccine you would have some sort of efficacy even though that mutation may be present are children getting more sick with this new variant? Well, I think the jury is out, out there. The, uh, the simple answer is we don't know. What we do know is this mutation is making it the virus become more efficient mm. to be able to attach to the receptor that it needs a to a, a to receptor that it requires to attach to in order for it to gain entry into the body. So the variant is making this virus more efficient to be able to infect people, but whether it causes more severe disease or um, is still not really, uh, uh, we still don't really know that because there's not enough data around the, the, the mutation. But the, the virus has become more robust, it's become more e easily transmissible because it's, with this mutation it's gained um, its ability to infect humans more efficiently. Right. That's basically what it's done. Look, Prof, we all want to get back to work, to earning and, and to looking for a job, you know, I mean, we wanted to send our children back to school if it's safe to do so. What's your advice to education authorities, to parents and to learners uh, who are preparing to go back to school soon? What, what's the safest way to do so, given the current case numbers? Okay, so it's, it's still the same. Unfortunately, it's still the same messaging that we have to have the social distancing. We have to keep our masks on um, and keep them over our nose and our mouth, um, hand washing, sanitizing. There's no different messaging. The messaging is the same public health message, that if we stick to those basic principles, we will retard the ability of the virus to uh, be able to move from one person to the next. So those key principles should be stuck to. And of course, any innovations um, for us to be able to get children back to school, doing as many activities outdoors as possible versus doing everything indoors, opening the windows, the normal basic principles that we've always encouraged people to do, those should protect us. If we do uh, stick to those basic principles, we'd be able to get some protection. And obviously, we hope that then everybody will have access to the vaccine, then we can go back to some level of normality in the population. Prof, I always say that the only thing that spreads faster than this virus is misinformation. And look, we need people like yourselves, better minds to give us the facts. Uh, we thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you very much, Blaine. It's been a great pleasure.